definition right now. Um, I'm supposedly a doctoral student, and my supervisor and I will be talking about that. <laughs> no doubt. And I'm glad that I'm here because I got to meet some of these amazing young people who I'm supposedly working with. But, um, <laughs> But, but, but what I have been doing is um, I've taken over at, as the Director of Gender and Women's Rights at the Commission. And for me, what that meant was an opportunity to be a part of these gender laws. We have a body of gender laws that have been passed in the past, I would say, 10 years um, from the other side. So not from the side of looking at it um, in my doctoral thesis, which I still am doing but now being faced with the reality of these laws that are very, you know, there was very much a conversation about, I wonder what these people were thinking when they were sitting down and drafting this. And now I really wonder what those people were thinking when they were sitting down and drafting this, but for different reasons altogether, because as I think both Jane and um, Ruth just before me have pointed out, it actually is a very different law that people are dealing with in their daily lives. The laws that they live under are those that are practice by the traditional authorities. The bits of paper that I've been dealing with um, at my desk in various places around the world are not actually what people are thinking about when they go about their daily lives, particularly in rural areas. So very most recently, um, Malawi was on the map again. It wasn't Madonna this time. This time it was, <laughs> although she's done her best, but this time it wasn't Madonna. It was um, Erica Neva. Now, Eric and Eva, and most of you will know him if you've heard of the story as the hyena. Yeah. Um, I don't know, should I read my slide or should I just begin? So anyways, here's Eric and Eva. Let's just go back, I think I'm gonna. Here's Eric and Eva going about his life, doing his job, <laughs> has an interview with the BBC about his job, and is very proud to explain his sexual prowess and how he is called upon um, to perform an important cultural function in his community, which is warding off evil um, through his cleansing, sexual cleansing of widows or if, um, if your son has died, so of bereaved women. He is called in at a most tragic point in a woman and a family's life to ensure that that cycle of tragedy doesn't continue. That's his job, um, or was his job. And I don't, I don't know how the BBC found that man, but the <laughs> thing is, they could have found him, they could have found any, other, any number of Anivas. It is not, and I think maybe for Malawi that's the sad part, or not the sad part, because the first question that most people will ask is not why did he do it, it's why did he tell the BBC? <laughs> You know, why was he telling the BBC? We know about that practice. It's, as a Human Rights Commission, 10 years ago, we did an extensive um, piece of research into cultural practices around the country. And that piece of research has gone on to feed into the Law Commission Gender Justice Project. So the criminalization of harmful um, practices, which is what they've done, but then it, it, it includes cultural, social, and religious, so the criminalization of mainly harmful cultural practices. It has come up in um, the Gender Equality Act, of which um, Eric and Eva was charged as being contravention of, in the HIV AIDS bill, which I'm looking at for my PhD thesis, in our Child Justice and Protection Act. So in various terms, there's this decision that, oh, well, you know, there are these cultural practices that are harmful largely because of their connection with HIV AIDS and the spread of HIV and AIDS, um, and they should be banned. And, um, and so, you know, it's come out in all of these laws. And for me, I've been thinking about what happens when we try to use the law. And that, that, that law commission project, I find, is a very middle class, very high brow sort of educated, let's sit here and talk about what is good and what is bad in our society and how we can craft a law to, to, to fix it. You know? um, it's quite removed from the community. I think, well, I mean, apparently, Jane, that's also what your, your research is about. So there's, this, there's this disjoint between what people think about and what is important for them and what um, those of us who are sitting there crafting laws decide um, must be done to sort out the bad stuff in society. 
So it was decided that you know, harmful practices such as the sexual cleansing services provided by people like Aniva are bad ones. Um, so in all of these pieces of legislation or draft legislation, Gloa Ufa, which is what this practice is called, um, comes up. So for me, I'm looking at that, um, and I'm looking at um, the provisions of the Gender Equality Act specifically, and what it means to cast such a wide, loosey-goosey net um, to catch people out um, when actually it's entire communities that are involved and implicated in um, something like a sexual, sexual ritual, sexual cleansing of widows. Um, and I'm thinking as well about this this regional push. If you see in the if you see in the Sudal, in the African Charter, um, um, the Maputo Protocol specifically, there is talk about harmful practices and the need to bring an end to that. The due diligence that the government must be practicing. So you are actually doing something to bring those to an end. But what happens when actually those things don't ever trickle down to the communal level? It doesn't ever come down into the laws and the bylaws, which is what we have in Malawi. Our traditional leaders um, write bylaws. And those bylaws don't speak to either the constitution, they don't speak to any of the gender um, laws that we have, or, or anything of the sort. Anyways, in 2013, uh, Malawi enacted the Gender Equality Act with the stipulated aim to promote gender equality, equal integration, influence, empowerment, dignity, opportunities for men and women to prohibit and provide redress for sex discrimination for harmful practices and for sexual harassment. Um, so I think the, the idea was to target, to isolate and target the continuing gender equality problems that we face as a country. And um, the, the act has been operational since 2014. Surprise, this is the very first time that anyone's ever been charged under it. So since 2014, the Gender Equality Act has been on the books. Um, it applies to all persons, it applies to all matters. Um, but in spite of that, what we actually have is a complete paucity of any kind of jurisprudence around harmful practices in the country. We don't have engagement with the police, with law enforcement, with first responders who would be able to recognize or think about something as a harmful practice and not just culture. I mentioned the study that was conducted by the Malawi Human Rights Commission earlier. Um, and um, it, the commission spoke to, and I wasn't there at this time, but they went around the country. They spoke to um, a, a whole range of Malawians. And even though it's a very small country, I, I wish now that I'd had a map of it that showed you the division. So we have a multiplicity of, of eth ethnic groupings, of traditional practices. Um, in Lilongwe, there are people who do not know what um, hyena, the hyena guy was practicing because that's completely foreign to them. And it's as foreign to them as it is to most of you sitting here. They just have no idea what that practice mm -hmm. is. I was speaking about it um, with um, the lady who helped me look after my kids. And she was like, it's what? They do, they do what? I said, yes, no, this is what's happening. And I had the opportunity, because of my role at the commission, to travel down there to Sanjay, which is where this, um, this particular practice, widow inheritance, widow cleansing, Groa Bufa, um, takes place. In the video, the BBC, um, it was funny, at the beginning, I, didn't, I, re I, I read the subtitles. And with the subtitles, you actually automatically sort of read the subtitles and didn't listen to the man speaking. And the subtitles it talks about how he slept with over 100 and something girls, and so on and so forth. He did not mention that at all in what he said. So I went back and put my hand over the subtitles and just listened to what he was saying. And he was talking about his work and how he's hired to do widow cleansing, um, but not initiation sex, fisi, which is hyena, and which is what was widely sort of publicized. Is that he was this man who was sleeping with these young girls as an initiation rite. That's not the case. He may have slept with young girls who were widows. Um, but his job was a widow, was widow cleansing. That's what his job, they're also called feces. It's just, that's the name given to these people who are involved in sexual cleansing. Um, but anyways, these are all, these, all of these things, whether it's uh, initiation sex for children, whether it's widow inheritance, because a man, your husband has died and then his brother takes you on as an additional wife, or whether it's um, the, the initiation sex, sex for young girls so that they can become good in bed and, and better sexual women and so on and so forth. All of that is highly 
it's highly reinforced by the socially constructed gender roles and patriarchy and power relations and the ideas and beliefs that actually disadvantage women and women and children. And um, in Malawi, we decided that our way to deal with this was to do something about it through these provisions, such as the one in the Gender Equality Act. And the provision itself, harmful cultural practices are defined as any social, cultural, religious practice of this definition section, um, which on account of gender, sex, marital status, do or are likely to undermine the dignity, the health, the liberty, or result in physical, sexual, emotional, or psychological harm. That's the, that's the definition of what a harmful practice is. The actual provision that Eric Aniva was charged under was um, being in contravention of Section 5.1 of the Gender Equality Act, which prohibits these practices by stipulating that a person shall not. And this, for me, is, is, is really where I have um, intensely conflicted um, by the whole Eric Aniva case. And perhaps I need to come clean and say that in my privileged role at the Malawi Human Rights Commission, when the BBC report came out, now what we don't have that's very, no. <laughs> I will put that away for some time. What we don't have, <laughs> what we don't have, we have a very strong child justice protection network in Malawi. We have a, a, a mechanism that is quite, almost seamless. So Save the Children and UNICEF and groups like that have funded the police, the Malawi Human Rights Commission's um, Child Rights Directorate, um, we have special child justice courts set up, and this system works together just seamlessly. The minute it came out, man, 104 children, they were in action. Um, and I was sitting there with the director of child rights, and the police were calling us, like, we're on the ground right now, we're looking for this man. Okay, we found somebody. No, the video, it's not him. No, we're going to look for somebody else. No, this, this happened. Ah, but we don't know what to charge him with. It doesn't seem like there's children involved. I said, but what about Section 5 of the gender? And then let's look into the fact that he's HIV positive and he was knowingly engaged in the sexual, um, um, in unprotected sexual encounters with women. And this is also something that he mentioned in the video. So the police, the police charged them with, with Section 5, with an attempt also of Section 5, which isn't there in the law. Um, they threw in some stuff about children. Um, they said, oh, we're not sure how to deal with the HIV thing. We're going to leave that out. Um, and then that was it. So all these other provisions got thrown away. And all that was left was Eric Anima and Section 5 of the Gender Equality Act. He was, within a day or so, the BBC, now the world, was sort of, you know, there was a lot of noise all of a sudden. All of you know about the hyena because of it. The president said, this man, get rid of him, throw him into jail. The lawyers were like, well, how is the president now directing who should and shouldn't be thrown into jail? Um, the community was not really up in arms. They were still more like, well, what's the BBC got to do with this? And why did he speak to the BBC? Um, and then UN Women, for example, and other groups rushed to the scene. They interviewed him. And this was in the time that he had just, he had just been arrested. So there was a lot of noise, there was a lot of fanfare. And I sat there at the commission thinking about this man who just was proudly explaining how he's really doing a good job and how people don't really complain. And when somebody says no, that they don't want to be cleansed, he actually doesn't get involved, he doesn't force them. And in fact, there were witnesses who came onto the stand and talked about that, that no, you know, he came and I said, that I don't want this to happen to me. And he left, he didn't come to the house, he didn't touch me, he didn't force himself upon me in any other way. Any other way. I went down to Sanjay and I was there during the very first hearing of the matter. It was the first time that his lawyers had met him, even though we at the commission were saying, this man needs a lawyer. He needs, he needs legal representation. He needs its staff. Because a person should not commit, not engage in, I feel like that's both him and the, the woman who's there as a part of this harmful cultural practice. Not subject another person to it. That's the family who bargained with Eric and Eva, who said, look, you know, no, 6,000 parts, mm -mm, it's a bit too much, let's make it 4,000. Uh, maybe, okay, fine, we'll, it will end at 5,000, 500, 5,000, that's about 100 rand. Um, or encourage, which is even the traditional authorities there in that community and the entire community. It's not that this isn't something that didn't happen, this happens all the time. One of the things that Eric himself said is that, well, you know, if 
fine, I guess I've been thrown into jail, but there's other guys who are going to just continue the work, um, the good work. So I don't know what we've actually done with this provision. I feel like if we read it correctly, then all of these people um, are involved in and ought to be standing in the witness stand beside, um, um, ought to have been prosecuted alongside Eric and Eva. It was a novel prosecution. Um, it raised issues of women's human rights, gender equality, um, and so on and so forth. We rushed down there as the Human Rights Commission because under the Gender Equality Act, we at the commission are supposed to be the enforcers of the Gender Equality Act. And it's, it's really pathetic how I was just like, we will go there, we will show them how we, <laughs> under the act, are supposed to be here to give help when it comes to any dispute on gender. And the magistrate was just like, uh, there's no gender here. This is a criminal case. We're going to deal with this as any other criminal case. Uh, the prosecution were like, we will expose you to the NGOs that you are. You need to come here from the Malahi Rights Commission. Mm -hmm. The defense were like, no, you're obviously here just to help the prosecution, so please can you be on your way and get out. And so we had to sit down. And none of my gender activism, none of my just you know, the first witness came in. She was this old, old lady. And the prosecution said, you know, we'd really like for her to be able to give her, her evidence in camera. And the defense said, well, no, but this isn't a sexual offenses case, because that's all I have to go on is this provision. There are no regulations guiding how it's supposed to, how it's supposed to be handled in the court. There's nothing to talk about what, what would amount to having committed, engaged in, uh, subjected another to or encouraged. There is no, it's, it's, it's just, just, just completely novel. You know, there's nothing. Um, the defense said, no, but it's not, it's not in the CP and EC. You know, it doesn't say anything about sexual offenses. So no, she must give her evidence here. And so she was forced to. And Malawi is a country where still to talk about sex is practically taboo, you know. Um, and still when the kissing scene comes on in the movie, I quietly cringe on the inside and wish I could leave it on watching with my father. You know, that's the kind of community that we're in. And so for this woman to stand there in open court, an open court in that, that community, and I know that I'm, let me just show you, that's Eric and Eva. Open court there means, so this was him at the front. The rest, this is closed, as far as that open court situation was. So the entire community was there. The entire community of his peers, of her peers, the magistrate in this case actually recused himself. And I know I'm skipping all over the places because I kind of want to get it all in so that you, I wish that you could have been there with me. The magistrate, or the original magistrate recused himself and said, I can't be a part of this because he too is a member of this community. And he's the one who told me, you know, that his lawyers haven't even been to see him. I've been visiting him in jail all these days. Nobody has come to see this man at all. Nobody's come to explain to him what on earth is going on. His, luckily, because, well, because the court is, um, you know, an hour away from Blantyre, and they had to use the, the, uh, uh, the chief resident magistrate of Blantyre. There was some time for his lawyers to have a conversation with Aniva before we went into trial. And now this old lady that I was saying, she came, she stood there, and the crowd of hecklers, mm -hmm. the translation, you know, um, of, so she gave her evidence in um, a version of the vernacular. It's a bit odd. It's not the usual to show. We don't speak the same language all the way across the country. I can understand what she was saying, but there was. Uh, mythicism and, and ways of talking about things that would only be clear to you if you were from that community. So, you know, for example, the, the, the magistrate asked, so then what happened? You know, she's like, um, when the fire, and then the fire, and to put the fire out so that the fire doesn't continue. And then the crowd starts laughing. And they had a set up of like, they had nine witnesses that were going to come. And I knew at that moment that nobody else was going to be able to come forward to talk about how they did not want to participate in what had happened. She said, I didn't, she said, I didn't want, I didn't want this to happen to me. So they asked her, I'm going to stop. They asked her, why did you, why are you here today? I've heard that people have been saying that Eric and Eva and I are married. And I'm here today to say that it's not true. I'm not married to Eric and Eva. You know, and um, and then the crowd laughs, and and then, oh, but okay, but did you have sex with this man? Oh, I slept sideways, you know. And they pestered her, and they hammered at her until finally she had to admit that yes, there was a sexual encounter, yes, there was penetration, and it had happened in about 2012. 
So all of that was for nothing in the end. In the end, he was convicted on the basis of his own shaky confession, given amidst the media circus, the president saying that you should be in jail, um, him being picked up for a proud interview that he'd given, um, the UN women there at the, at, the, at the police station to ask him what on earth was going on, the police themselves regarding him as sort of a joke and a, and a myth. Um, and um, so that confession was the strength of his conviction. And the magistrate gave him two years. Nowhere, and I've, I will share it with anybody who's interested, nowhere is gender mentioned, as they had said to us at the time when we asked if he joined the case of gender is not an issue in this case. Um, you know, nowhere is it discussed as in any kind of depth or with any kind of feeling. Um, and I'm just wondering, what was the point? What have we done besides make sure that nobody else in that community is going to show off to the BBC that they've got like some real sexual prowess? Um, nobody else in that community is going to be open to changing this. And no survivors, women who did not want this happen to happen to them, girls in many cases, because we've talked about child marriages, many of these widows are actually girls, um, are going to be able to come forward because they know that if you do, then you will publicly be heckled and laughed at and shamed and forced to, she was on trial, much more than Eva was in that case. Um, and I'm sorry if I didn't put in all that I have. I have like case law and section 12. Please, <laughs> 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 <laughs>